colleagues, colleagues joining online. Good, got rid of this morning. Um, welcome everybody to our um, biweekly seminar. The Berman Institute um, has the pleasure today of introducing our speaker. Welcome to those who are online as well. Um, for those who are online, we'll um, follow our usual, usual format. If you have questions, comments, please put them in the Q&A and we'll take them as they come um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so yes, so without further ado, let me just um, take a moment to briefly introduce our speaker who I think probably doesn't need an introduction to many of us. Um, we're really delighted to have uh, Dr. Christine Grady from the NIH Department of Bioethics join us today. Dr. Grady is the chief of the department um, and has a background in nursing and bioethics and philosophy, trained as a nurse at the bachelor's level and master's level um, in uh, Boston College for a master's and a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown University, where she maintains a faculty uh, position as well. Um, and Dr. Grady is perhaps best known in her scholarly research and work for her work in international, US and international research ethics including in clinical trials, um, has done a lot of really groundbreaking work, particularly on issues involving informed consent, sort of demystifying a, a little bit the, the informed consent and, and guiding um, practice and policy towards um, productive ways of conducting informed consent and really identifying some of the challenges and barriers that have plagued those processes for a long time. She's also done a lot of work on other issues in research ethics, including issues involving vulnerability, study design and recruitment, um, and uh, a, a lot of other work, including work that addresses the ethical issues faces, faced by nurses and other healthcare providers. And published um, a number of articles, over 200, and um, textbooks as well, including the Oxford textbook on clinical research ethics, the Hastings, Hastings Cello Center Fellow, uh, a fellow um, of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics, and um, at the American Academy of Nursing. Dr. Grady was elected member to the National Academy of Medicine, and we're, again, really thrilled to have you here um, to share the presentation today. So thanks. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for being here. Um, I was gonna talk about um, ethical challenges in vaccine research. And I know that there are a lot of people in this room and probably hopefully on the, online as well, who know a lot about vaccine research. So hopefully it won't be too elementary for you, but I think you'll recognize some of the challenges that um, I hope to get to. Of course, these are my views and not anybody else's and I have no relevant conflicts of interest. What I thought I'd do in the few, in the really few minutes that we have is talk a little, very briefly about the value of vaccines and some of the general ethical challenges in vaccine research, and then explore the selected challenges from selected cases. And I have a little asterisk there to remind myself, I'm, I'm going to only be focusing on uh, vaccines against viral infections. And so we all know that there's a lot of vaccine research at, you know, for cancer and autoimmune diseases and other things. I'm not going to talk about that at all. And I also um, have a bunch of cases, some of which will be very familiar to you, some of maybe less familiar. And I am apologizing in advance for the, there's a lot of facts, but not comprehensive facts, right? So there's gonna be a lot missing from the story of each uh, case that I propose, that I mentioned. So that's where I'm gonna go. And the two areas that I'd like to focus on are testing vaccines during public health emergencies and testing vaccines when there is an effective vaccine available. So Stanley Plotkin, how many, I'm sure many of you know him, the, he's written more about vaccines than anybody and I've learned a ton from what he's written, says one of the brightest chapters in the history of science is the impact of vaccines on human longevity and life and health, excuse me. And people have talked about, you know, how vaccines have saved lives, have improved, productivity and resilience and have you know, created a safer, healthier world. This is just some factoids really from a, a WHO report counting the impact of vaccines that they put together in 21. And you can see just in the first bullet, the number of lives that have been saved by vaccines just in, the, in recent years. And so vaccines are good. This is the, the bottom line of this slide. <clears throat> we also have a more recent experience that all of us have observed 
Um, and the estimate is, this is from the Commonwealth Fund. The estimate is that between December of 2020 and November of 22, COVID vaccines prevented more than 18 million hospitalizations and more than 3 million deaths and saved the United States a trillion dollars in medical costs. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, those are pretty impressive numbers. So again, value to vaccines. <clears throat> At the same time, interesting things we've learned about vaccines through this COVID experience. This came from a WHO uh, film that they've recently put together to uh, accompany their new immunization agenda 2030. And what they noted, which I think are really important things is that during COVID, of course, science found solutions. We did have vaccines and it was great, but the biggest vaccine rollout in human history also revealed longstanding inequities across facing humanity, across all vaccinations, diseases, pathogens, and countries. And COVID also fueled the largest backslide in essential vaccines in almost three decades. So it's sort of a, the negative side of what's happened. And just because I mentioned this, the WHO has come up with this um, new global vision and strategy that they recently published Immunization Agenda 2030, <clears throat> with the goal of a world where everyone, everywhere, at every age, fully benefits from vaccines to improve health and well-being, which I really like that notion. So, vaccines are good. That was my first message. The second one is we need more research, and we need more research because there are new infections that emerge old diseases, old infections that reemerge, and intractable diseases that persist. And we just don't have all the vaccines that we could use. We don't have yet effective or sufficiently effective vaccines for many really important global infectious diseases like HIV and malaria and TB. And we also really want better vaccines than the ones that we have, even though some of them are effective at, at some level for diseases that persist for COVID, for influenza, for other things like that. So we really need new vaccines. We also have new technology. So we all know that messenger RNA platform was first successfully used during COVID, but now there are uh, large numbers of studies being done in a number of different infectious diseases using the messenger RNA platform to try to see if there's a new uh, level of success with vaccine development. Um, I loved this chart that Stanley Plotkin had in, in a paper that he wrote. And you can see, I mean, not to spend any time on it, but on the left, currently licensed vaccines, we've got a lot of them. But look at this table too. Uh, and this is selected diseases and, vac and infections for which we either don't have one or don't have a sufficiently effective one. So Vaccines are valuable, we need more. Vaccines have always been controversial. From the beginning of time, the smallpox vaccine 200 years ago, people were worried about turning into cows. That's what that picture on the left is from getting uh, vaccinated with you know, something that was related to a cow. There are people who are always worried about the safety and untoward effects of vaccines. There's a phenomenon that people have described as the vaccine paradox, which is basically the more successful a vaccine is at eliminating a disease, the less acceptable are any side effects that go along with a, a vaccine. And people just don't want vaccines anymore because of side effects. There's always been this tension between vaccines as seen important for the public good versus individual rights. You know, we can reduce morbidity and mortality about diseases, but nobody can tell me that I have to get vaccinated. And then, of course, we have uneven access and inequities across the world in terms of vaccine uh, availability and delivery. So lots of ethical challenges in vaccines, um, development and testing of vaccines, which is where I'm going to focus. But there are really challenging ethical issues in decisions about allocation and distribution in public health use and social acceptability. And there are a lot of people working on these issues. And they're they're really as challenging as the ones in the testing space. But I'm gonna talk about testing and research. And I wanna just remind us that, you know, the, the goals of research in terms of finding a successful vaccine are 
at least twofold. And there actually are others, but safe and effective. Okay, so what does safe mean in the context of a vaccine? We need a vaccine that's reasonably safe for a wide range of possible users, wide range in age, wide range in geography, wide range in comorbidities. And that's really an important context. And with the paradox that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, it has to be safe enough that people in that wide range are willing to take it. And then it also has to be effective in a, uh, a large percentage of people who are at risk. But it can't be just those two things. It's got to be relatively simple to deliver, store, administer, affordable, widely used, widely available, excuse me, and accepted and used, which is not a given, right? The last part. So how do we usually develop vaccines? And most of you know this, so forgive the beginning stuff. But um, as I'm sure you know, before a vaccine even goes into clinical trials, there's a lot of work that goes on in the, in the laboratory in vitro and in animal uh, preclinical work. And there's a lot of uh, really important steps in, in the process. I mean, first of all, there has to be some understanding of what the microbe is, and then a description of any natural immunity that people might have to that microbe so that um, a, a vaccine candidate can try to mimic that. Then there needs to be a process of selecting or establishing a vaccine, in vitro work, preclinical testing, and then a decision about when to start clinical testing. And then clinical testing standardly goes through these three phases, one, two, three, as we're all familiar with, where one is small number of healthy volunteers to ask the question of, is this safe? Uh, and is it safe at the doses that we're testing? Um, phase two, a larger number also, uh, continuing to look at safety, but also asking questions about Im immunogenicity and immune response to the candidate that's being tested. And then phase three, which are the pivotal efficacy field trials, which basically ask the question, how do people who get the vaccine differ from people who don't get the vaccine with respect to the disease that we're trying to pre prevent? And, and again, continuing to look at safety, et cetera. Um, and so that's the, the standard process. Ethically, what do, we, what do we think about? So first of all, I think there are ethical considerations that we think about for all clinical research. No matter what kind of clinical research we're doing, there are ethical uh, frameworks, there are ethical requirements, there are ethical considerations. There are some that I think are very specific to and distinct in vaccine research that have gotten a less attention over time in the research ethics literature. And then since most in viral infections, I was talking about viral infectious diseases, are global, um, there are also the, a whole host of issues that come up in the context of multinational research, especially research done um, in low and middle income countries. So what about the ethical considerations for all? I mean, I have to use this framework for obvious reasons. <laughs> There are lots of ways to think about the ethics of clinical research, but you know, this is mine, this is the way I think about it. Um, and generally in research, all of these are important. You, you need to sort of think through each one of them along the way. And um, you know, there's a sequence and you know, we argue it's universal, et cetera. I think it's a useful strategy to think about the ethics of research. What about in vaccine research? I think all of these are important in vaccine research all of them, but I think the challenging part is this, what I'm gonna call reconciliation between social value and science, social and scientific value and risk and risk and benefit. And that's where I'm gonna to try to focus over the next few minutes. And I mean, Joe introduced me as saying, I've done a lot of work on informed consent. You will be shocked to know, I'm not gonna say almost anything about informed consent today. So unless you want me to answer a question. So, in the decision points along the way for a vaccine trial, there is this important dual function, right? We have to figure out what's the study design that's most appropriate to find the safest and most effective vaccine for the widest range of at-risk people. So that's really paying attention to the social value and scientific validity and the participant selection. While we respect, protect, promote, participants' rights and welfare, and that through um, minimizing risks, optimizing informed consent, 
you know, treating side effects, et cetera, and having a great attention to what happens at the end of the trial. In vaccine research, there are a lot of interesting things that I think make it just different from research on therapeutics. One is healthy. They're healthy people. These are not people that have illnesses. We're asking healthy people to participate in studies. Certainly phase one and phase two, even phase three, where it's at risk populations usually, you know, they're, they're all healthy people who might be at risk of developing infection. Um, often children, because many of these diseases are childhood diseases. Some of them actually are everybody diseases, but children also are affected. Large numbers. So you saw the numbers on the other side of the phase one, two, three. In, in phase three vaccine efficacy trials, it, that FDA slide said thousands. But if you look at the trials that have been done, most of them are tens of thousands of people, 60,000 people in a trial, not 6,000. Um, I think this next thing is probably the most distinctive uh, difference between vaccine research and therapy research, and that is in vaccine trials, um, individuals accept risk, which they do in any trial, but there's a really small chance that they will individually benefit. And I don't think everybody, even volunteers for vaccine trials, really understand that. And so let me unpack it just a little bit. Um, if you have a $60,000, 60,000, sorry, person trial, that's a randomized placebo control trial, 30,000 will get the vaccine and 30,000 will get the placebo, right? Um, so of the 30,000 that are getting placebo, they're not gonna get any individual benefit from the vaccine at all, right? In the vaccine group, only some small number really of that 30,000 would have gotten infected without a vaccine. Um, it is actually the reason we need so many people in order to show the difference because only a small number will have gotten infected without it. So the people in the vaccine group have to be um, those who would have gotten infected anyway. They have to get an effective vaccine or effective enough vaccine that it protects them. Um, and they have to be among those that sort of are protected. And so it's a, it's a complicated uh, thing for people who are volunteering to understand because um, they, they really are not gonna get a high chance of benefit. And yet they all have some risk. Actually, maybe the vaccine group has more risk than the placebo group because they're getting the, the candidate vaccine, uh, but there are risks of you know whatever happens in the trial procedures and things like that, um, stigma, whatever, other things that come along with vaccine, vaccine trials. And then of course there's benefit to the community because part of the reason vaccines are so great is because they not only reduce morbidity and mortality, but there's a way in which you can um, protect others if enough people are vaccinated uh, through herd immunity. So I just put this cartoon up just to sort of exemplify what I was just talking about. Now this is not, this is showing 80% uh, efficacy, but you can see 80% efficacy in this cartoon trial was because from, Instead of 10 people getting infected in the placebo group, there are only two in the vaccine group. But see all the blue people? Those are people who are not, not uh, benefiting from individually from the vaccine trial itself. And we know that you know, this, the numbers are pretty striking for the um, recent COVID vaccines. This was just numbers from the Pfizer, the original Pfizer uh, BNT trial had 46,000 participants that were followed for six months and 927 confirmed cases of COVID, um, most in the placebo group and 77 in the vaccine group. And that's why there's such a high vaccine efficacy rate. But you can see just the number I want you to think about is uh, 850, no, sorry, 927 out of 46,000. And so the rest of the the rest of the cohort, um, I guess, was lucky. And of course, then we have herd immunity, which I already mentioned. So I think that the sort of crucial challenge in developing vaccine trials is this one that I've tried to describe as reconciling social and scientific value with risk. And now this, this is also a cartoon and it's probably most indicative of my 
lack of technology skills because it's not really a balance, not, not completely a balance. Um, but there is some way in which um, as social value goes up, we might be willing to tolerate more risk. And as social value goes down, we might be willing to tolerate less risk. Um, I also think it's really think it's really helpful to think through what, how do we figure out what's socially valuable, socially and scientifically valuable? And in the setting of, a, of an infectious disease, there's a lot of detail about what is happening on the ground. What is the public health need? What is the burden? Who gets infected? What happens to them when they get infected? How fatal is the disease? Uh, what else can what else can mitigate it? Can, what else can prevent it? Um, lots of really important questions to understand the public health need and burden um, against which to add, what are the scientific possibilities? What do we know about natural immunity? What can we mimic in this vaccine candidate? What do we expect to see if we uh, test this vaccine candidate? Um, how are we going to measure it? I mean, so many important details of that. And then I put acceptability in there because, because vaccines are controversial, the idea that a, a vaccine will be socially valuable if it's not accepted by the community or by the society or by the world, it, it's not. It takes away the social value. So I think there are a lot of things that are uh, put into that evaluation of social and scientific value. And then in the risk column, certainly there are side effects of the vaccine itself or of foregoing the vaccine if we're talking about trials with um, again, for infections for which there are already effective vaccines. There are social effects for the participants and for others. There are sometimes bystander effects that we should worry about or communi other community risks. Um, and then there's this question about whether or not being in a trial without getting individual benefit should be sort of calculated as part of the risk. And so there's, there's that question. And as I mentioned, sometimes we tip the balance a little bit. If, if there's more risk, we want more social value and, and vice versa. That's just my cartoon. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about a few cases. Um, and I, I mentioned already, very selected. One is this, because we've just lived through it, but it's not the only uh, infectious public health emergency infection that we've lived through recently. And that is, how do you test vaccines in, this, in the context of a public health emergency? And so we can think about COVID, of course, but also Zika and Ebola, all of which were relatively recent. Um, and I think it's helpful to think about, you know, what is the context of a public health emergency? So these are, this is made up by me, but I think some of this will resonate, I hope. I think there's a, there's a way in which there's a sense of urgency. We need to figure out what's going on and find ways to solve it. And there's uncertainty because we don't know everything about what's happening with the disease and things are changing fast. And that causes a lot of anxiety. And so there's this push to go faster, do more. Um, and that has to be intent or is intention with the need to make sure that everything we do is done with a certain amount of rigor so that it's trustworthy so that we can trust the, the results at the end and people will accept them. So there's this idea of we have to move fast without compromising either the ethics or the science. We have to evaluate the kinds of trade-offs that are inevitable in deciding to go forward with one product versus another or with one design versus another. We have the challenge of data that keeps evolving and the, and the uh, changing dynamics of the public health emergency as well. You know, we, we learn more as we go along. It changes what we know and how we would have made this calculation to begin with. And so does the, both of those, the dynamics of the emergency also change. There's a real tension between what some people have called learning versus doing. You know, there's a sense in a public health emergency, we need answers to some of these questions. We need to learn how to prevent, how to treat, how to mitigate. But we're also in the we're also in an emergency. We need to take care of people. We need to do what we already know. And you know, there, there's a tension between those two desires. And then of course, a, always a need to be rapid and accurate in communication. So some of the really specific things I think that come up in this context is how fast do you go? 
What is speed in the context of figuring out social value? Is it a valuable thing to go fast or is it a negative because of the possible compromises? And how do you figure that out? And how much should it matter? What kind of a factor should it be? What is the appropriate design to ensure that there is social value without too much risk or compromise? Um, is it and when is it ethically permissible to use a placebo as the comparator in the setting of public health emergency? Who should and should not be included in the trials? You know, when are kids, when should kids be included? When should they not be included? What about pregnant women? What about um, other groups that might be vulnerable for, for various reasons? How do we keep attention in the, in the setting of moving fast with science to engage in communities, to inform consent and to public trust? And what do we do if we've started a trial and vaccine is effective, then we have to do something about that trial, but also all the other trials that are um, either just starting or ongoing. We did a project early in 2020 where we looked, we, we began to ask this question, how do we, what, how do we think about doing a vaccine trial for COVID-19 um, fast without compromising quality or acceptability and ethics? And what we did was we took five, we took, sorry, um, several different models, standard RCTs, accelerated RCTs, uh, controlled human infection studies, and early authorization without any efficacy data, which at that point in time, people were recommending, by the way. And we compared them on five, what we called ethically relevant dimensions, as you can see, confidence, generalizability, feasibility, speed and cost, risks and social risks, and concluded that the, the most appropriate way to go without compromising was accelerated RCTs. So randomized placebo controlled RCTs, but moving fast, like combining phases and things like that. At the same time, there was a huge call for uh, controlled human infection studies in COVID-19. And I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Um, in fact, there were thousands, this, this article says 14,000, I think in the end, there were more like 30,000 people who uh, said they were willing to volunteer to be in a challenge study for COVID-19. And the, the debate was very heavily focused on social scientific value versus risk, is my, in my view. The, the proponents of controlled human infection studies said, we need to go fast. This will get us the, the opportunity to answer questions quickly. Um, we don't have to worry about risk because young people are, don't die as much as old people. So we'll just put a bunch of young people in the study and it'll be fine. The opponents said, uh, well, we really don't know enough about risk. We don't know. I mean, people at all ages are getting infected. Some people are getting sicker than others. We don't really know enough about it. We have no interventions to try to treat people who get really sick. Um, and I'm not, we were, you can tell I just gave away my, we're not even sure about the social value because um, it'll take a while to develop a challenge model. Um, you know, it could be months, it could be a year. And so, you know, maybe the social value, if it's based on speed, is not that significant. And it, it brings up the history of challenge trials. You know, there's a long history of use against malaria, cholera, the common cold, influenza, a bunch of things. And there's, there's some literature that suggests they can actually be very informative about certain things when you're trying to develop a vaccine. So it wasn't a completely crazy notion to have this on the table, right? But it was in the, at the time anyway, rejected. Uh, I, I couldn't help but bring this up. Uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago now, Frank Milliner and I were asked to uh, consult on a, with a group who were trying to do a challenge study with a bacterial infection model. And we looked desperately in literature for something that talked about how do you think about this ethically? And we found nothing. And so we wrote this paper and the interesting um, historical fact is that the first journal we submitted to was, this is old news, we don't, and we couldn't find anything. We could not really. Anyway, the, the point I wanna make is uh, when I look back at this paper in the circle part there, the two things that we thought were at the top of the list were this, we didn't call it social value in this paper, but you know, the justification, why do we need to do this? What's the reason, what's the, what's the value of doing it? 
And what's the risk to the participants? So that was clearly at the center of our thoughts. There was a group that um, Seema Shaw led that did an analysis of the ethics of controlled human infection studies for COVID. And they used basically the same two at the top. You see the red and the green. Uh, and then of course there are other considerations, but the top two are really the social value and risk. And, and then a subsequent WHO panel, some of whom the same authors were part of, uh, concluded basically the same thing. But interestingly, as things evolve, as we know more, as we have vaccines now, as we have more data about risk, there are now channel studies for COVID going on. This is one paper that came out about a year ago. Um, and basically what they were looking at is, you know, could they effectively challenge people, get people infected with their model? Okay, what about Zika? Zika had a similar kind of story, actually, a very different disease, very different time. Um, it was a major public health crisis, especially in the Americas, even though it wasn't a brand new disease, it was a disease that had been festering for many years in many places. And most of the infections were asymptomatic or mild, except there were these really drastic consequences for some people, um, including the congenital Zika syndrome in babies where they got microcephaly and, and lots of comorbidities. And some adults got neurological complications as well. So there is this sense of a really urgent need to develop a vaccine for Zika at the time. And there was an advisory panel that came together and you know, thought about, well, should we, should we recommend a challenge trial? And they concluded what I put there, ethically justified in principle, but premature. And premature because risk to the bystanders, there was an idea that you know, the people in the trial would infect others, and not sure that the added social value was worth it when there were other options for testing a vaccine. Interestingly, I mean, I guess, fortunately, the, the uh, Zika crisis waned pretty quickly. And so 15 months later, there was this analysis done by Vanis and, and colleagues who said, you know, now it's to the point where we can't do a traditional efficacy trial because there aren't enough infections. And we know that Zika is less risky and there are ways to mitigate it. So now we should be thinking about doing a challenge trial for Zika. What about Ebola? So Ebola, we know again, was not a new disease. It's been around for a long time, um, but there was a very significant outbreak, which I'm sure all of you remember in 2014 in, in West Africa. And um, you can see the numbers, I'm not gonna say any more about that. One of the things that was so interesting about what happened during Ebola was that there were many concerns, first of all, about the acceptability of doing research at all in the setting of this public health emergency. Something that I didn't see as much during COVID, I would say, uh, this worry about doing research in the setting of the emergency. And trial design itself was one of the most contentious areas of debate. People really fought about it. There was real disagreement about what was the, the right way to go and what kind of a design should be used. And I love this quote at the bottom, which is um, from a report that Jerry Kirsch and others did post Ebola to sort of look at it, they said, you know, despite lots of stakeholder disagreement, what they all agreed on later was we spent too much time debating it and we should have been doing more research. We said it should have been moving faster. Um, a lot of this, just to, to emphasize the point, a lot of this boils down to disagreement about whether the most important thing was to go for the social and scientific value of doing research or protect the welfare of the individual participants that might be in those trials. And, you know, as people said and pointed out, this is even bigger stakes when you're in a crisis where the disease itself is highly fatal. There's a lot of tension there between these two poles. And I think, oh, sorry. I think I overdid this, but this is, you know, two concerns, same idea. One was really much uh, focused on getting good data and the other on protecting people. What I found in retrospect is that there was not enough attention to the differences in this, in this debate between therapeutic trials and vaccine trials. That, you know, there is a really 
different kind of pull when you have somebody who's sick with Ebola and has a very high chance of dying and you have an intervention and you wanna do a placebo controlled trial. That feels different than a placebo controlled trial in a, in a population where people might be at risk, but not all of them are gonna get Ebola. And you, know, you really wanna know whether a vaccine works or causes more problems as it has in other cases. And you probably know there were three vaccine trials that were started in West Africa during this outbreak. And they were, they were different in, in a variety of ways, but I'm just gonna point out one difference. One used a standard placebo. The other two used strategies which delayed the uh, giving a vaccine to the control group so that they could see whether there was a difference between those who, in, in infections, between those who got vaccine and those who didn't or got it later. Um, and this was uh, talked about as a much better model because people did get vaccine eventually, but they did have to, some of them had to get infected in order for the vaccine trial to be successful. And I, I also think this last point is really important that not only was this controversy confounded by disagreements about the what should be most important, but there was misunderstanding about the various designs. So some of the designs used were, as people say, much more complex in terms of the statistical uh, analysis, much, much less efficient, much more prone to bias. You know, there are different ways that um, different designs have value and, and others don't. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. So I wanted to spend a few minutes on endemic infections. So not public health emergencies, but infections that are around all the time. And how do we test vaccines when an effective vaccine already exists? And there are lots of examples of this. I mean, I just put a few on this slide. There's, there are lots of, there's literature and debates about how do you test new vaccines for cholera, some of which actually comes into the public health emergency space as well, because sometimes the cholera outbreaks, you know, call for a new vaccine, but there are cholera vaccines out there that are effective. Rotavirus has had a lot of attention in terms of this question, and so has H HPV or human papillomavirus vaccines. So I'm just gonna say a few things about this. I think what's interesting about the fact that you know, we think this is a different scenario when there's a, already an effective vaccine, is that in fact, the public health need and the need to understand how a vaccine works in a specific context varies quite a bit and can be quite dramatically different from one place to another. And the effectiveness of the vaccine may also vary from one place to another. And we don't always know how it varies. I mean, rotavirus, I think, was one of the greatest examples. In the original trials, it was like 80% effective, but when it, when it was repeated in some uh, low middle income countries, the effectiveness was more like 50%. And there were lots of questions and possible explanations for that difference. But you know, in, before doing the trials, that was not known. There's also a, a lot of variation in, in terms of the availability of vaccines. So even if they are effective vaccines, they're not always available and given in the way that they're recommended. And so some people don't get them. And that's a, a question of, you know, that's a really controversial issue because do we take advantage of that in order to do trials to try to help make vaccines more available or is that exploiting people? And of course there is probably intuitively a lot of um, uh, credence to the idea that less expensive, easier to use, easier to manufacture, um, locally produced and maybe safer, more effective vaccines are, are good. We, we want them. We want to find things that uh, fit those categories. So we go back to this, you know, balance between how do we think about the social scientific value and the benefits or risks to the participants. And here's where risk becomes an important fake, uh, factor because there's this general idea that it's that you can't just, or it's very difficult to justify an RCT with unvaccinated comparators when a vaccine, a protective vaccine exists because the individuals in the study 
would benefit from getting the effective vaccine and they might be harmed from not getting it. Um, there's also a sense that an effective vaccine should never be withheld from somebody who wants it. And there's also a sense that a um, double blind placebo controlled RCT may not be scientifically justified if, if on the ground there is effective vaccine in the, in the mix and you really need to know how, how a new vaccine compares. So many of the current ethics guidelines recommend that placebos not be used as a comparator when an effective intervention already exists, although most of those guidelines are not specific to vaccines. And research committees, ethics committees, and regulators and policymakers might not approve an RCT if there's an effective vaccine. A lot of them would not. So what do we do? I think there are questions like, is it or when is it ethically acceptable to do an RCT if people do not want the vaccine? Can you set up a trial where you only enroll people who don't want the effective vaccine? Um, that's ethically and scientifically complicated, but possible, right? Another possibility is setting up a trial for people who are not getting it, even though there is one a vaccine out there, people who are not getting it. Um, and then there are lots of proposed trial designs in which the, in order to avoid giving people placebo, the question is, can we delay it? Can you delay it three weeks or six months or, you know, stagger uh, by cluster or something like that so that um, everybody gets vaccine, but not everybody gets it at once. And you're still able to answer the scientific question of does the vaccine protect? There was a WHO consultation in 2013 that looked at this question specifically to vaccine trials and concluded, not surprisingly, uh, vaccines are clearly, I mean, sorry, placebos are clearly acceptable if there is no vaccine or if it's intended, um, or sorry, not or, and the vaccine is intended to benefit the population and clearly unacceptable when a effective vaccine exists and is currently accessible and the risk of not receiving the vaccine couldn't be mitigated adequately otherwise. But then they talked about, between these two polls, there are several examples of ethical ambiguity. And they say sometimes use of placebos could be justified even if a vaccine of proven efficacy exists and the risks of using a placebo or withholding or delaying administration of the existing vaccine are greater than minimal. And, and they lay out a couple of cases, but this is the challenge is figuring out when this is okay and when it isn't. And I put an asterisk next to placebo because placebo comes in lots of flavors in uh, vaccine research. It's sometimes an, another active vaccine that's not expected to protect in any way from the uh, infection that people are testing a vaccine for. Sometimes it's a traditional placebo. Sometimes it's just no, um, no vaccine at all. So one example, just to give some flavor to this, is uh, HPV vaccine. So many of you know HPV, common virus, spread sexually. Up to 90% of cervical cancers are um, believed to result from HPV infections. And most of those infections are acquired before the age of 30. There's a number of licensed HPV vaccines, more all the time. Last count I saw there were seven, oh, sorry, six. Um, and they're different. Some are bivalent, some are quadrivalent, and one is not available. And they are very efficacious at protecting infection against certain virus types, HPV virus types, but they also have other kinds of protection. Some of them protect against anogenital warts and some against other HPV subtypes. But it was estimated in 2014 that only 5% of eligible girls in low and middle income countries are getting vaccinated with HPV vaccine. And the another piece of uh, another resource said it was about 13% in 2020. So that's still pretty low. The reasons, there's a limited supply of HPV vaccine. There's a lot of concern about it, side effects, worry about vaccines in general. There's worry about inequities. There's worries about how to deliver vaccines and the costs and the, um, and more recently COVID has, you know, just put a damper on every, everybody's vaccine coverage. 
So here's the interesting challenge that came up with HPV vaccine is that based on data that had come from clinical trials, the strategic advisory group on um, vaccines um, recommended a two-dose vaccine for girls between the age of nine and 14 and three dose for girls over 15. And then put a caveat on it that said for the over 15s, when it's feasible, affordable and cost-effective. And in the meantime, there was data that was coming from post hoc analyses of trials where they were testing three doses because people in the trials weren't getting three doses. And so they could do some post hoc analysis of immunogenicity after the first dose. And then there were other studies that all of which were suggesting that, for, that one dose might be adequate. Um, and a lot of people argued one dose would increase coverage, lower costs, increase cost, cost effectiveness. And yet SAGE, when they reviewed the data in 2019, said it was premature. They didn't have enough data to recommend one dose. And they really needed the clinical trials that were ongoing at the time to be able to make that decision. And there were a lot of controversies about how to test them. You know, can you do an RCT testing one dose compared to two doses if two doses is the standard recommendation? Um, or do you need to use an alternative design or, or how do you do these studies? And this is a busy slide, there are two of them actually, and these are from the uh, SAGE meeting in April of 2022. And I only wanna show one thing, and that is if you look at the top, the first two, I mean, sorry, the right-hand side, the first two are post hoc analyses. The second two are RCTs, one of which is a delayed uh, start. Uh, the, the last one and the top one on the next slide are cluster randomized trials. And the last two are um, RCTs, but not using, but using different doses. So there's it's sort of all over the map, but there's been a lot of controversy over these designs because you know the recommendation has been two doses or three doses for certain ages. In April, the SAGE recommended updating the dose schedules for HPV as follows. And so now the recommendation is one or two doses for the primary target and one or two for women a little bit older and two doses for women who are over 21. I found a really interesting article, I thought, that raised an issue that I have not raised yet. And that is, with respect to this controversy over HPV vaccine, these authors said, and you just look at the third bullet, they were concerned about the fact that the whole controversy about how to test HPV vaccines was really about how to test them in low middle income countries. And nobody was saying we should do a one dose vaccine trial in the United States, for example. And so what they point out is that, um, a dichotomous approach to this important research question while advancing the field risks reinforcing the intrinsic structural racism embedded on our research and health frameworks. And we have the essential task of determining how to advance knowledge and expand care while challenging intrinsic neg native, sorry, negative patterns. Um, I wanna just end, I know I'm close to end of time anyway, but um, the, Global Forum on Bioethics had a meeting on alternative, the ethics of alternative designs a couple of years ago. And they concluded a couple of things, which I think are uh, of note. One is don't call these other designs alternative designs. Uh, sometimes the design, the, the design that you use for any trial should be appropriate to the question and the context. And so alternative, alternative makes it sound like it's secondary or somehow not as not as good or as important. And what they say then, the following considerations are relevant to determining if a non-traditional design um, are most appropriate, including scientific validity, social value is not written there, but I think it's implicit, the risk minimization and practical questions about recruitment, feasibility, et cetera. And in order to determine it, you've got to know as much as you can about the nature of the health condition being studied in the context in which it's being studied, what other available treatments are available, what resources are available, and what people who are stakeholders believe is preferable. 
So to end, I'm gonna say vaccines, immensely beneficial when they're safe, effective, acceptable, and used. Testing vaccines in clinical trials is scientifically and ethically complex in every case, maybe more so in a public health emergency and when there is already an effective vaccine in play. It's ethically critical in every case to assess the social and scientific value of the proposed study in relation to the risks to participants and communities of that proposed study. And this requires deep knowledge of the science, the public health context, societal attitudes, the risks, but also insight, judgment, and really scrutiny of the ethics when making decisions and implementing them. That's... That's the end. Thank you very much. I think it's time for a few yeah, questions. Yeah, we have time for a couple of questions. <clears throat> Both got a question. Is your hand with me for mic so I really don't like to follow? Any questions? It all made perfect I sense. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you have any thoughts on it. Sort of what we saw with with COVID, with um, uh, sort of vaccine based controls around access to certain things, social accommodations, whatever it might be, restaurants or things like that, which right. is very much on the table. And sort of, do you have any thoughts about how we use vaccines now in society and how that intersects with this notion of social value in the context of the trial? Is there some yeah. effect on that? I think at the time we were beginning COVID vaccine trials, we weren't thinking about that kind of implementation of you know controls in social settings. We were thinking of, God, this is a scary infection and people are getting sick and dying. We got to do something about it. Um, and I, I think only after it became clear that we had these vaccines that were incredibly effective, and you know there was still the risk of getting getting disease all over the place, that people started talking about the how we use them socially to require people to do certain things or not do certain things. I mean, I think, you know, we could do a whole analysis of that, the controversy over that, because I think we've sort of turned back the other way now. I mean, there in the beginning, there was, I think, pretty good arguments for why, you know, mandating vaccines in certain settings, especially healthcare settings, made sense. I'm not so sure they do anymore. Um, and so, you know, having to really wrestle with what the data, how the data have evolved, what we're dealing with now in terms of the infection and making decisions that are wise today is something that not always easy, but something that we need to do. I don't know if that answers your question. One more. Yeah, I it's interesting because during the Ebola trial, this observation of we just spent too much time with the main design. It's like to hear, did we learn lessons from that and or what work should be done respectively? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we did learn lessons. I think we learned that we shouldn't waste so much time to, like, fighting about the design because vaccine research and treatment research too is important when we have an emergency and we don't have an effective therapy or vaccine. Um, and so, you know, getting to it more quickly, I, I think I may have even mentioned, I was struck by the fact that in, in all of the COVID trials, both therapeutic and uh, placebo, I mean, in vaccine, I didn't hear a lot of debate about the use of placebo. Everybody just assumed that's what we're gonna do. And in fact, the, the debates about the controlled human infection studies, you know, I think took it one step further, you know, and you know, we're willing to take risk in order to answer these scientific questions that are so important to answer when we can answer them. And so I think it's a really, I think we did learn a little bit from that. How do we prepare for the future? I mean, you never know what the next emerging infection is going to be, the next public health emergency, but I, I do think that you know, we, we've gotten better at uh, realizing that, or, and maybe it's from where I sit, so let me just say that caveat, but I think we've gotten better at realizing that uh, doing research and doing really good research is so important because, you know, right now, 
um, Zika is still out there and we don't really have, we don't have a vaccine for Zika yet. And, you know, it's going to be a while until we do. And if so, if, Zika, if we had an outbreak of Zika this week, we'd be in not quite the same position we were in, you know, five years ago or six years ago, whatever that was, but we wouldn't be that much better. So we need to be more prepared for future outbreaks in the setting, in the context of being ready to jump on the research questions as quickly as possible. And we have so many scientific, um, you know, progress in science that allows that to happen all the time. We're getting, you know, better scientifically, I think. Great. I think we're out of time. Maybe I have one question online, but we're going to have to close, unfortunately. But thank Sorry. you again okay. for joining us. Okay.